In this video clip that we're all completely tired of by now, you can see a wave of momentum transfer from the front to the back of my Elantra, and it just stays there. The rear suspension gives and it doesn't push back. It's too soft for what I'm doing with it here. That resulting squat unloads my front suspension and keeps it that way as long as my foot's on the gas. That in turn prevents the tires from biting. It looks like it's dragging its butt, and that would be fantastic if this thing was a rear wheel drive car, but it's not. As I shift gears, you see that rocking action repeat. Torque steer and traction loss have always been an enormous issue with this car. In the previous video, I replaced strut purchase with a set of Yoshifab camber plates that were made for a 92 Mirage. This was done in an effort to move the upper strut perch a bit to try to minimize the effect of bump steer. In another modification, I moved the strut hole just like it had to be done before to correct its camber, except this time I did it on a different hole. This allowed me to gain enough strut clearance so that I can finally safely fit a larger, stickier set of performance tires under the front axle. I've been stuck running around on the hockey pucks for safety reasons because using wheel spacers with the slicks only left me with two threads on each lug nut. I don't like wheel spacers, and they didn't fit without them, so I was out of options. These are the smallest drag slicks available for a 15-inch wheel. But in order for me to show you any of the fruits of my labors, I have to be able to legally drive this car on the street again. My inspection sticker just expired, and my headlights are toast. They can't be saved, and I'll explain more about that later. I ordered the only used set I could find online, and I hope they're better ones than the ones I've got now. The shock absorber's job is to provide damping, which determines how fast the weight can move, but they won't stop that weight if it's more than the springs can handle. For your own safety, whenever you're doing suspension work, put the jack stands under the body, not under the axles or the suspension arms. I put the jack stands under the shackles for the rear trailing arms, that looks like the best place for me. I don't know the history on this car's rear suspension. I don't know whether it's the original suspension or if it's a combination of parts from other cars cobbled together or what. I don't know if the rear shocks are any good, I don't know if the factory strut provides enough damping, but I do know that with an engine five times more powerful than the one the car came with, I'm completely overloading these shocks and the rear springs that I've got. I don't want to buy expensive adjustable shocks for this car for multiple reasons. The main one being that the bumper sagging over four inches on launch tells me pretty much that these things are shot, but if these are the shocks that the car came with, then they're 27 years old now, and that's kind of understandable. I ordered a new set of KYB GR2s for an Elantra. They call them Excel Gs now, but they're the same thing for this car. They're better than the stock ones, but not by much. Looks like we got ourselves a shake weight. Seriously, why did I even buy spring compressors? Just like with the front wheels, the spring in the rear doesn't make up the whole gap between the perches. It's just more of the same on the driver's side. When I do this, I like to support the rear axle with a floor jack and lift the axle while I loosen up the top strut perches. Then lower the jack once the nuts have been removed from the upper perch and remove the springs. Depending on how high your car is raised, there's a possibility of damaging brake lines if you don't have the axle supported. But raising the axle saves some elbow grease and it keeps you from dropping the springs and the shocks once the last fastener's loose. There you have it, shake weight number two. Let's get both of these things over to the workbench and break them down. There's a flat spot on the tip of the shock absorber shaft that you can grab onto with a pair of vice grips to get the lock nut loose. If you don't, the shaft turns and it doesn't go anywhere. Looks like when I fully compress it, it sticks. Let's compare it to a brand new one and see how it stacks up. Well, it doesn't stick anyway. Looks like the new one rebounds a little bit slower too, which is roughly what you're looking for if you want more damping. I'm just happy it doesn't stick. It's nice to freshen these things up. What about those springs though? I don't know what my options are yet, but let's take some measurements first. Looks like I've got about 11 and 3 quarter inches long by about 4 inches wide. The inner diameter is about 3 and 3 eighths of an inch, and when you're shopping around for springs, that's the kind of measurement you need to go by, the inner diameter. I happen to have the rear lowering springs here that match the ones I installed on the front wheels. The measurements are spot on, but I really don't think these things are going to work for what I want to do. There's just too many coils on them. 
the more coils, the softer the springs will be because there's so much more material to give. They're at least progressive rate springs, but they're lowering springs, which means they're softer overall. I'd be pretty lucky if they're even close to the same spring rate. Sure is pretty though. It's pretty weird putting shiny things on my Elantra. Yeah, nah, these things are way too soft. I think I'm gonna have to go fish, go a different route. I'm using these spring measurements to go find a set of springs with a significantly higher spring rate. I just need a set that are squared on one end and tangential on the other. Parts arrived and I think I got a set of springs that just might work out for me. I'm pretty sure these are springs anyway. If they're springs, they should bounce. Yeah, uh, nah, those weren't the springs at all. Let's try that again, shall we? Springs. I picked out a set of rear springs for an all-wheel drive 2001 to 2005 Pontiac Aztec for about 75 bucks. 510 pound rear springs. When I measure the coil, I get about 16 and a quarter millimeters. Let's see what the stock ones are. Got about 11.4 on the stockers. Lowering springs are about 10 and a half millimeters. And that's one and a half times the material to have to bend on each one of these coils on the Aztec springs. These things are gonna be stout. I can already tell right now these are gonna be too long. Might have to cut a coil out of that. Maybe two, we'll see. So, new springs, new shocks. I need to harvest some parts off of these things in order to put the new stuff together. Namely the hardware, the bushings, the dust covers, bump stops, and hats. A Pontiac Aztec weighs 4,050 pounds. A four-door Hyundai Elantra GLS in stock trim weighs about 2,452 pounds. When you consider there's a 1,500 pound difference between these two cars, you can easily guess how extremely stiff these springs are going to be. I doubt they'll even compress under the weight of my Elantra. But I do know one thing. I know they're gonna bounce that squat right back to the front wheels where it belongs, and that's what I'm trying to do here. Hopefully I can get this job right after only doing it twice. Mechanics who service cars for a living only like to do a job once. That's why you won't ever find anyone selling you on the idea of installing Pontiac Aztec springs in your Elantra. This is gonna be really funny. This thing's gonna be sitting way up in the air. Let's see what it looks like. Putting these things back on is pretty much the same as disassembly. You reuse all four of the nuts and bolts you remove from each side, line up the assembly, and start from the bottom bolt. Honk them down tight, then raise the jack. Put the upper perch through the hole, and honk the two nuts down on top really simple. The only way somebody could get this wrong is if they had preloaded springs and they took the top strut nut loose without using spring compressors to take that load off first. As long as you use your head regarding your jack and your jack stand use and the locations where you set everything up and you check your springs for preload, it's pretty hard to get this wrong. It's a pair of 17 millimeter wrenches, a 14 millimeter socket wrench, a pair of vice grips, a pair of jack stands, and a jack. You don't have to take the wheels off, but it sure does make it a lot easier to lighten film if that's your kind of thing. So how far do you think a pair of 510 pound springs will compress when we put it down? This is crazy. Nearly four fingers and a thumb. Four fingers for real. A loose four fingers at that. Same basic thing on the other side. Two fingers in the front, that's about how I like it. Two fingers. I can't fit three. I can fit my feet in the rear. Oh, 
I'm gonna take them back off, cut one coil off, put them back on and see where that puts me. Of course, this scene means that I saved you the trouble of watching me remove them again. Click the like button if you wanna skip the boring upcoming scene where I reinstall them again for the second time. Do it right now because that scene is approaching quickly. The gap between the top coil was a tad over two inches. I cut both springs exactly the same, and I put them all back together. It'll make a difference, but is it enough? Thank you for all voting overwhelmingly in support of skipping that scene. I thought it was boring too. Can't get four. Looks like it's three fingers in the rear. It's still at least a finger up higher than it used to be, and it looks a little bit stupid, but haven't you seen the rest of the car? Because of how the front end likes to lift, I'm actually okay with this. We got three fingers in the driver's rear, too. That's just how it goes. It's Let's get this thing outside for a walk around and a good laugh, shall we? It's got a little bit of rake to it. Still looks really innocent with those steel Ultima wheels, and I really love that look on this car, but I can't go trolling with it until I fix those dang headlights and get a new safety inspection sticker on the windshield. The last time I took this car in for an inspection, my headlights barely squeaked by, and they really should have failed. I knew they were already toast, and I also knew that I was already cheating with them to begin with. The inspector thought they were just out of alignment, and he tried to make adjustments, and he found that the adjusters were broken. Well, the mounts for all the bulbs were dry rotted and broken out, and I duct taped all the bulbs in, and that's more likely what was causing the misaligned headlight issue than the adjusters were. That's not actually something you want to point out to your safety inspector if you already know you're cheating. He didn't spot the duct tape, even though it's fairly obvious. Duct tape is not a correct fix for any problem, no matter what Mythbusters tells you, but it's a good enough temporary fix for desperate people in desperate times. It's usually a big red flag to any mechanic or an inspector that something else is not right. Let's blow this thing apart and get a better look at the problem. I have to take the grill off to get to the two centermost bolts that hold the headlights in, and that's easy enough. The whole thing's only held on the car with four screws. Now, you see that right there? There's your problem. It's not just the bulb mounts that were dry rotted. The same problem the bulb mounts experienced had long since taken its toll on the seal between the lens and the rest of the headlight housing. It's all dry rotted inside and out. The lens is fogged too, on both sides. Absolutely everything plastic on it is already broken, including the adjuster assemblies. It feels good to finally take this thing off, and it's just four bolts, two harness plugs, and three bulbs holding in each headlight. The side markers are just held in with the spring, it's an absolutely stupid design because they pop off all the time, especially at speed. Adds character, I guess. There's a better close-up of the bulb mount, also dry rotted, just like the housing is. The plastic just crumbled. Every time it rained, they'd fog up with water droplets. There's only one new set of headlights available in the entire aftermarket in America for this car. They're normally $60 each, but the seller knows they have the last set, and the last I checked, $250 a piece. It took nearly all year long for me to find another used set of headlights in good enough condition to put back on the road. These came out of Iowa Falls, nearly 1,200 miles away. Based on what I see right here, I wish I had the rest of that chassis that these came from. These lenses are intact, and they're in good shape all the way around. The seals are good. The bulb sockets are in perfect condition. The plastic's even still shiny where they screw together. The bulb side of the plug isn't dry rotted. The ears where you bolt it to the chassis are intact, not cracked up and broken like my old lenses were. All the same stuff can be said about its wife, too. To get a better look at them, first I'm going to start with a wet paper towel to get the dirt off, and then I'm going to polish up the lenses. I'm using metal polish to remove light scratches and oxidation from the plastic. You just apply a little bit of elbow grease and rub it like Nanook in a circular motion until it dries up and squeaks. Then buff it off with a clean part of the cloth and what you end up with is a brilliant shiny exterior finish that shows off just how crappy the rest of the plastic lens really is. Nine times out of ten it's just that outer layer of oxidized stuff that makes the lens look crappy. 
For example, here's one of the horrible dry rotted headlights that were on this car back when the video started. They're not in good shape like the used ones I just bought. I'm going to polish part of it so that you can see the difference. You see that? The shine from the overhead light? The difference between the untreated oxidized side versus the shiny unoxidized polished side? It puts a shiny new finish on faded 27 year old plastic. I'll do it again so that you can get a better look at it. Don't use power buffers for this because the added friction they produce will heat up and melt the plastic and embed the metal polish permanently into the lens. This is best done by hand. Every car ninja has their own trick for this. I've heard of people using toothpaste, soft scrub, or bug spray, or even expensive headlight detailing kits, which to me just seems stupid when all it takes is a 10 cent squirt of metal polish, some elbow grease, and an old t-shirt. It's a more permanent fix than bug spray, and it doesn't yellow the lens. Whenever I finish the polish job, I like to follow up with an auto wax, just to keep the bug guts off of it and to make them easier to clean later. The replacements I picked up turned out crystal clear. Looks like I have an extra waterproof connector for the side marker lights if I ever need it. You never have too many waterproof two-prong connectors. I need these bulb assemblies both of them, including this lock ring missing half of its teeth because the one that's there now has no teeth on it at all. I'm glad it's on here. Looks like I also get free headlight bulbs too. I hope I remember to put these somewhere safe and oil free, which I probably won't. I'm just going to use the headlight bulbs that are already on my car right now that I know that work. And what about this adjuster assembly though? Will it budge or will it be seized up from sitting in the same spot for nearly three decades? Let's see. I use silicone spray in an attempt to make turning the plastic parts against the metal threads of the adjuster rod easier. Felt like a smart thing to do, but let's face it, it isn't going to do a damn thing. Next, grab the 4mm socket to help discover this fact, and when you turn it, you hear that? That's not gears turning. That's the splined rod spinning inside the cracked plastic drive gear. This is the same problem I had on the other ones. This was something I was hoping to avoid because I've looked for a replacement part for these adjusters and they're just not available. I learned from the old ones that they're easy enough to take apart, just two screws and you pry them open. Hopefully I'll be able to use all the best pieces with some kind of glue and be able to put this stuff back together and fix it. The biggest problem is this cracked drive gear. When you turn the adjuster rod, the torque load just snaps and breaks the driven gear in half and then it's all over. But I'm going to clean up these parts and try to glue it all back together again. At first I thought that emblem and trim adhesive might work well, but that ended up being a bad idea. It does a really good job gluing metal to plastic, but it's just too soft to withstand any kind of load. It didn't matter how careful I was cleaning up the excess and clamping it, giving it ample time to drive, it's just not sturdy enough. But I think it's a two-pronged problem. If I make the driven gear easier to turn, it'll take some of the load and the stress off of the drive gear. So I'm going to spin and work the driven gear with a power drill until it spins more freely. Clean up all the corrosion and salt in the threads and grease the adjuster rod. I'm just doing what I can to make it a little bit looser, that's all. But what I should have done from the start was use plastic bonding epoxy instead. It says it sets in 20 minutes. So I mixed up a batch, glued them, clamped them, cleaned them both up, and let them dry overnight just to be sure. When I press the rods back into the gears, I put my finger on the hole on the end of the gear so that the excess epoxy could only squeeze out through the cracks inside the plastic. And then I cleaned up all the excess. It made more sense to use a hose clamp than to use those vice grips that you saw me messing with before. I think they turned out very nicely. The epoxy dried strong enough for the adjusters to turn properly, and I should have done that in the first place. But that's just the up and down adjuster. They both need to work properly, and so I checked out the lefty-righty adjuster on both headlights just to be sure. They're fine. It's much simpler, and it works. Let's go put this thing back together and get it legal. Three bulbs, two electrical connectors, and four bolts. There are BMWs that require disassembling the whole grill assembly just to change a headlight bulb. They're also a lot harder to take apart than this and to put back together. But I'd bet they don't suffer from these kind of stupid issues that I have to fix. It sure is going to be nice to see at night again. The shootout was the first time I'd driven this car at night in three years, and I was driving blind with no moon out in the country roads. I couldn't see anything 30 feet in front of me unless it was reflective. This fix will completely change how I get to use this car, and I'm so happy to finally be doing this. My patrons would tell you that I found this car's manual transmission twin in the junkyard. They got to see a video about that, 
but it was worse everywhere and in every way I couldn't use its headlights. Fixing this old car is getting very difficult, and with the drying up donor marketplace, I believe that this is the era where all of this car's fixes become fabrication jobs. Even the aftermarket part supplies have all dried up for this thing. It's just not a popular enough chassis to support a profitable parts market in the United States. It might be the most popular car in Syria, but Americans just didn't fall in love with these things. I did a quick headlight alignment job on my garage door to get the headlights in range and then dropped it off with the state inspector. Can you believe it? I passed it. I didn't even cheat. I've still got two more modifications to finish before I get it aligned, and as much as I want to take you all along for a ride, it would be a treacherous, perilous, and generally unsafe thing to do. Plus, we've run out of time for this video. Okay, fine. We'll go for a ride and see what a difference all this made. You got me. You know I can't resist. I want this at least as badly as you do. Last time we drove this thing, it was pulling to the right and it was misfiring. Since then, new rear springs and struts and headlights so that I can see at night, and I gapped all the plugs at 20 thousandths. All of my ignition problems are gone now. This car likes 20 thousandths. I didn't bring the laptop for a log because I'm just trying to feel it out, not to tune it. Yep, still pulls to the right. So far it's exactly what I expected. Even though I'm still on the hockey pucks, let's do a little 10 PSI pull and see if it squats. Watch the horizon. The squat is completely gone. Still has plenty of wheel spin, which is fun. With the ignition fixed, the spool and the power output is immediate in the lower gears and it quickly finds the rev limiter. It might help me to get a lighter wastegate spring though. Maybe I'm flattering myself, but I'm pretty sure that Nick Blackhurst from Bad Obsession Motorsports was talking about me when he mentioned the dummies who build performance drivetrains and install cheap tires. <laughs> These Dicciarelli hockey pucks weren't ever intended to be my race tires though, and I doubt that anything I could stretch over a 6 inch wheel will ever be enough for this car. is a much greater challenge than all-wheel drive. With the way this car is built, it's going to take a lot more changes than I've made so far, a dry road, some glue, and a lot of driving skill in order to keep the tires planted. The power curve is on or off in this thing, and it doesn't like to be pedaled. Once I got it out on a longer, straighter, flatter, faster road, it once again confirms that it's pulling to the right. I'll have that sorted out soon enough. The new headlights proved their worth. I can actually see at night again. The camera sucks in low light, but it's a drastic difference from where I'm sitting. That's really going to help with getting the car tuned in these short winter days. But we're out of time for real now. Tuck and roll. I've got a few more changes to make, and I'll be back with another episode very soon. 